Hey everyone, welcome back to Cyberbee. This is the channel where I share what I learn in cybersecurity as I go. And today we are finishing off the detecting web attacks. This is part three. So I was recording it and going through it in real time with you guys, which is what I really want to do, but the audio crapped out halfway through. And so I am redoing this part once again. So we are down here in detecting insecure direct object reference, IDOR attacks. So what is IDOR? Insecure direct object reference, okay, I said that. It is a vulnerability caused by the absence or improper use of an authorization mechanism, okay? It allows one person to access an object that belongs to another, okay? It is broken access control, okay? So as we remember from our previous, our part one, uh, iOS top 10 for 2021, number one is broken access control. Let's see if it says anything here that gives us more of a hint. It's the most serious web app security risk. Nope, not really. Okay. Okay, and so how does IDOR work? So it is not a vulnerability caused by poor sanitation, poor sanitation like other web-based vulnerabilities. The attacker manipulates the perimeters sent to the web app gains access to an object that, does, that doesn't belong to him, and, then, and is then able to read, modify, or delete the contents. Here's an example of better understand. Here's an example to better understand how the IDOR vulnerability is exploited. So imagine a simple web app. It retrieves the ID variable from the user, then displays the data that belongs to the user who made the request. So something like this. Right, let's defend the IO slash get underscore user underscore information question mark ID equals one. Okay, so this makes sense if you are ID number one and it requests and it shows you whatever you need to know. Um, but if you are able to see ID number two and three, that's when it becomes a problem, right? So it doesn't check that the ID value in the request belongs to the person who's making the request. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this web. Vulnerability is called IDOR, gotcha, broken access control. Okay. Okay, so how do attackers take advantage of this attack? They steal personal info, they access unauthorized documents, they take unauthorized actions like deleting and modifying. All right, so how do we prevent it? So we need to have some check in place to make sure that the person making the request is authorized to do that. Mm -hmm. And unnecessary parameters should be removed and only the minimal number of parameters should be taken from the user. Okay, so if we look at the previous example, we don't need to get the ID parameter. So instead of getting ID, we can use the session info. Okay, we can use the session info to identify the person who made the request, gotcha. So detecting IDOR attacks, as you know, this is what I think is the meat and potatoes. Um, they are harder to detect than other attacks because they don't need to have a certain payload like SQL or XSS. HTTP responses would help identify IDOR attacks. However, they are not logged for several reasons, which makes it more difficult to identify. Okay, so it's a non number of methods, like check all the perimeters. Okay, what are all the perimeters? Um, I would like this to be expanded upon. Okay, look at the number of requests made to the same page. Got it. I see, so brute force, okay, I see. So it's like ID one or ID equals one equals two, three, four, five, six, kind of like that. Okay, that's why you would see requests made for the same page from one source, okay. Find a pattern, we will plan a brute force, okay. Right, exactly what I said. So these two are kind of the same, anyways. Okay, so let's look at this, I'll blow this up a bit. So as you can see here, these are like several requests made within one second, like 10 of them made in one second. So obviously that's not a person, but some sort of um, script or tool. So it says get, and it keeps going to this page, slash blog, slash WP WordPress, dash admin, slash user, dash edit, PHP user ID equals, look, 15, 7, 25, 26, 1, 24, 27, 23, 22. Da, 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 da. And they keep sending them to 302. 302, it's a W fuzz too. 302 from what we remember. Oh, can't. 302 access code. 
is, I think, a redirect. It's found. It's a type of redirect where the requested resource has temporarily moved to a different URL. Okay. So I think that is there. So, okay, as you can see, there's no special characters. We can easily read the logs. Okay. We can look at the source IP, which I did not look at. Okay, here's it's the purple stuff here. So it's like the same one. Um, it's the same one, essentially. These ones, .36 or .38, one of those might be a real person, but the .40 obviously is like not, right? Okay. Now that we know... I... That's interesting. They're also looking at response size right here. I, I know you guys can't see my cursor. I don't know how to record that in there. Um, was the attack successful? I see. So one, I'm really trying to, um, well, I'm not trying. I'm really understanding now that one is actually seeing the indicator of compromise and then two is like ascertaining if the if the attack was successful or not. So that's what I need to work on still. Yeah, there's this thing, the user agent header. Oh, header. The user agent header, WFuzz, is this. Okay, I didn't know that the end was that. Anyways, now I do. And they're looking at response sizes. Okay, so it's this at the end. So 302 status code, this must be the response size. So it's a bit or something like that. 479 bits. And then this is the user agent. Is this, you know, it doesn't tell us, that's all. I always thought the user agent was like at the very beginning. Anyways, I'm wrong. Um, what do I know? Since we don't. Response size, interesting. Um, I think for me, I still don't know what is considered a big size versus a small size for this response. For the response size is this. That's a very small chance. So this increases the likelihood that that tech was not successful. Okay, so let's go down to the questions here. So we're going to open up this file access, uh, password, file password is access, and it's asking four questions. What is the IP of the attacker who carried out this attack? What was the date of when the attack started? Was it successful? And was it carried out by a automated tool? Okay, so we're going to go here. Oh gosh. Please stop. Okay, open it. This one is going to be IDOR. Open this one, access. Okay, we're going to make this. Okay, so what can we, what can we control and find? It said, you're, they're seeing multi, like brute force. So maybe ID. That looks kind of legit. Oh, here. Right there. Bingo. Okay, so I think it would be this. Here's the date of when it started. Copy. Oops, sorry, I already did it. <laughs> so let's just roll down to here. When is this? 11, so March 1st, 2022, 11 uh, 42 a.m. and 32 seconds, which is that. Correct. I figured out how to do the copy thing. So we're good. So that's this one down here. Only because it starts equals one and it keeps going, right? This is the IP. 192.168.31.31.174. Yep. Was it successful? Okay. Was it successful or not? Question three. The answer was yes. I wasn't too sure why. I think because there isn't a ID equals 11. Like there wasn't something after it that signaled 
that it didn't go through or that they stopped. I don't know. The response sizes probably shows something, but they look so tiny compared to the ones above, like 5,000, 4,000, 6,000. Um, so I'm not really sure what to think there. It's nothing above, right? I can kind of compare it to, probably not. Yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure why <laughs> it was successful. Um, but we were able to get the fourth question, was the attack carried out by an automated tool? The answer is no, because if you look at the timestamps, one second in between, two seconds in between, one second in between, one second, this is like, how many seconds? Eight seconds, one second, five seconds, three seconds, five seconds. Like in an automated tool, as we saw before, in one second, there would be like 10 or 11 requests made. So this was definitely manual. Uh, okay, next one, detecting RFI and LFI attacks. So what is a local file inclusion? Okay, cool. It's a security vulnerability that occurs when a file is included without sanitizing the data obtained from the user. Central theme. It differs from RFI because the file that is intended to be included is on the same server that the web app is hosted on. Okay. Attackers can read sensitive files on the web server. They can see the files containing passwords that would allow them to access the server remotely. What is remote file inclusion? Okay, so local file means it is on the same server as, as the web app. Okay, so remote file means Okay, the file is included without sanitizing the data received from the, okay. It differs from because the file is hosted on another server. Got it. So attackers lure victims through websites on remote servers and trick, and trick them into running malicious code on the servers they have prepared. Gotcha. Okay. So local file, file and web app on the same server, remote file, file and web app not on the same server. Got it. So how does it work? Okay. All right, so if we examine the piece of code above, we can see that desired website language is selected using the language parameter received from the user. In a normal situation, we would put something like in for English in there, um, and then it will turn out like this. However, if an attacker enters the payload below in the language parameter, the web app will unfortunately display the, okay, etc. slash password file to the user. So payload would be like this, such a password um, percentage at zero, zero. Okay, so this, does that make a difference for you guys or not really? Not really, okay. So this is used to go to the parent directory, right? So in sec plus, we learned that anytime we see something like this, it is, um, what's it called, directory traversal. So they're trying to navigate to a different, or like to like the main directory and get access to stuff that way. Okay, that is used to go to the parent directory. Aha, uh -huh. since the attacker does not know what directory the web app is on, he tries to use this to access the root directory. Later, he names the file that and allows it to be included in the web app. The end of the string will be percentage zero. This way, the rest of the slash home.php string will not be read by the web application. Okay, so how do attackers use, use RFI, LFI? Ex executing code, disclosure of sensitive info, denial of service, how to prevent data sanitization? Yes, before it's used. Okay, detecting, got it. We have already mentioned what attackers can achieve. Since it can lose a lot of money, if vulnerabilities are exploited, we should prevent these attacks. So how can we detect them? When examining web requests from user, examine all fields. Look for special characters. Okay, so the backward slash forward slash periods. Okay, become familiar with files commonly used in LFI attacks. Okay, I feel like they should be linking this out to some sort of external resource for us to look at, like somebody's GitHub, just like before. Okay, look for acronyms like HTTP, HTTPS, and RFI. Okay, remember we're dealing with two different types, local and remote. The attacker injects a file into their own device and allows the file to run. 
To host a file, attackers usually set up a web, small web server on their own device and display the file using an HTTP protocol. You should therefore look for notations such as HTTP and HTTPS to help you detect RFI attacks. Okay, I feel like that just said the same thing as this one up here. But anyways, some survey we don't have to take. Here is the lab environment. Out of here, out of here, we are in file inclusion. Okay, right. okay, gotcha. Scroll down to the questions. Okay, so what's the attacker's IP? What's the start date? And was it successful? All right, so control find. This is this, right? There we go. 12 of them. But that's all there, okay. So this is it, line 178. Okay, so, and it has this vulnerabilities thing in it too. It also, oop, why is it like this? Vuln, okay. So it kind of starts from here and it says FI. Okay, vulnerabilities. I do think it starts here though. So let's check. March 1st, 2022, 11 35. And it's this, well, it's all of this is the same IP, so I'm sure it's this one. Nine, oh, sorry, 192.168.31.174. That's right. What did we say? 58 and 35. 58 minutes, 35. Yay, March 1st. Great. So was it successful? Apparently the answer is no. <laughs> um, I think the reason why it's no, it's because, let me just go back to this. So these last four, why? I don't know why it's always at the end of the log. Um, maybe because it's at the end of the log. Um, most of them were not successful because... If it was, we would see more of it in the log. I'm not sure. Like it didn't detect it or something like that, right? And so it goes back to normal and so they just bounce. I'm not sure. So I think the reason why they were not successful is because um, they were definitely doing this manually. Look at how much time is in between each one. Five or so that's 200 success, 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 success. But look at these response sizes it's only 50 that's so tiny compared to the one above it look at that 4000 4000 4000 4000 300 here 300 300 because it goes to a 404 so like you don't have to respond with much but this is a 200 so it was like a go ahead green light but we only got 50 back so i think there's something happening there yeah and it tried a few different uh endings and it still didn't work. I think that's the sign. I could be wrong though. Anywho, so the, the lesson itself actually splits into detecting web attacks one and two. So we just finished one. Um, and here's what we can look forward to for web attacks too. So detecting open direct redirection attacks, uh, direct traversal attacks, brute force attacks, XML, external entity attacks. Sounds like some ghost, external entities, <laughs> like some spirits. Um, okay, that's good to know. And this one, oh, because I didn't do it, I didn't go inside yet. I also want to show you, um, so we completed the lessons here. We did not start the SOC alert uh, investigations. There's six of them to do and two challenges. So we will get to that when we get to that. So thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, watch another one for more hands-on cybersecurity. Leave your questions and thoughts below in the comment section. I'd love to hear from you. And as always, stay curious and see you in the next video.